This is Bishop John with a homily from Friar Doc for Pentecost. The first reading is taken from the uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The Psalms, uh, the responsorial verses, are taken from Psalm 104, uh, verses 1 and 24, 29 and 30, and 31 and 34. The Epistle reading is taken from the first Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 12 verses 3 through 7 and 12 and 13. The Gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. As always, I urge you to read them uh, when you get a chance. This, uh, this morning, we see what it takes to turn a group of fearful, worried disciples into powerful, courageous evangelists. Uh, that is the uh, the addition of the Holy Spirit to their repertoire of experiences. It is also true that when the Holy Spirit kicks you in the butt, it really changes your life. The verses from chapter 2 of the Acts of the Apostles this morning recount the descent and release of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Uh, Jesus had promised his followers he'd send another comforter, quote-unquote, uh, during his his time with them before uh, before the ascension in John 14 16 and and so it happened the disciples were all together probably in the same place where they'd had the Last Supper with our Lord uh, but in any case in a house in Jerusalem verse 1 then a noise like a strong driving wind came from uh, from the sky and seemed to fill the place, verse 2, and tongues as of fire departed and came to rest on each one of them, verse 3. With the Holy Spirit bursting out of them, they began to speak in different tongues, verse 4. Devout Jews from every nation under heaven were in Jerusalem on the uh, for the festivities, verse 5. Hearing the sound, they gathered around like folks anywhere would, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Verse 6. They were all amazed because they knew all the ones speaking were only Galileans. Uh, verse 7. And so not particularly sophisticated international travelers, as it were. But somehow, each one of the visitors was hearing them in his native language, verse, verse, uh, verse 8. They were from the Diaspora, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, inhabitants of Mesopotamia, uh, uh, Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, verse 9, and from Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya near Cyrene, as well as travelers from Rome, verse 10. They were both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and yet they all heard the disciples speaking in their own tongues of the mighty acts of God. Verse 11. This all occurred on Shavuot, the, the Jewish festival of weeks, which took place on the 50th day after the beginning of Pesach, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is the, the Passover. Uh, Leviticus 23:16. Originally, a festival involving the first fruits of the harvest, uh, uh, Exodus 23:16, Exodus 34:22, and elsewhere, it had become during the uh, Hellenistic era also a time for recognizing the renewal of the Noahide uh, covenant. At the time, it was one of three pilgrim festivals celebrated each year throughout Jerusalem. Uh, throughout uh, Judea Judaism. The other two were the Passover, of course, and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles that took place each fall on the 15th day of uh, Tishri, the, the seventh month. Our uh, word Pentecost comes from the Greek Pentecoste, which means 50th. 
and harkens back to when the oral Torah was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, some uh, some 50 days after uh, Passover. It all it all links together, don't you know? Getting back to the miracle uh, in the reading here. Uh, there is first the rushing of the wind, then uh, tongues of fire, and finally the proclamation of the kingdom in many different tongues. We see the disciples speaking not in unknown tongues, not in glossolalia, but in the languages of the devout Jews from every nation. Verse 5 again. Who were there in Jerusalem and who had gathered uh, gathered around uh, uh, because of the noise. The people of the diaspora heard them speaking in their own tongues, heard their xenoglossia, heard tongues literally from just about every speaking, every uh, every nook and cranny of the known world. For mere mortals, especially Galilean rubes, as, as their more sophisticated observers must have noted, this was not an easy gig. In fact, it was an impossible gig. It was a mind-blowing, really powerful performance, all of it driven by the arrival of the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus had promised. The old law given to Moses was now written in the hearts and minds of the faithful and with obvious and powerful effects. This is the beginning of the church expectant as the body of Christ in the same way uh, that the Annunciation was the beginning of the Incarnation. The faithfulness of the uh, disciples, their, their willingness to say yes to the roles to which Jesus had called them, began the Church just as Our Lady's simple yes to the Archangel Gabriel began the divine infection of the world. Followers of the Way have served ever since as agents of the infection, spreading our prayers, our example, and our faith out through the whole world. And of course, baptizing all who will accept the call into the body of Christ in the name of the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The wonderful song, the, the glorious vision and language in the verses from Psalm 104 suggests the great Solomon as its author. But it might also have been David. He was no slouch in the poetry department either. In any case, the psalmist calls all of us to remember how great God is and to bless him with everything we are. Verse 1. It is in his wisdom that God made the world and all the creatures in it. Verse 24. <coughs> Furthermore, it is his continuing support of and involvement in the world that drive his both life and death. Verses 29 and 30. He didn't wind up the universe like a clock and walk away from it. The psalmist wishes God to be glad in his works, verse 31, and seeks himself to be pleasing to him, verse 34, uh, to add to his gladness. Like a loving son, he seeks not to please the all-powerful Lord of the universe, but to do what will make his Abba, his Papa, happy. If only we could go and do likewise, Luke uh, 1037. There are so many examples in Scripture of followers of the way who simply made this intention, this prayer, habitual. Their examples and the examples of the saints down through the centuries call us to do likewise. The clear-eyed understanding of God's constant intertwining in the works and the creatures of the earth, verse 29 again, written about a thousand years before the Master walked the earth, is breathtaking. It is so uplifting as to make the heart sing with great hope. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. Verse 30 again. The spirit renews and strengthens. Paul's teaching for the uh, Christians in Corinth in chapter 12 of his first uh, epistle to the Corinthians is also a consequence of very clear-eyed wisdom but speaks a little softer than the psalm. His teaching very succinctly acknowledges the various experiences of the Holy Spirit they have had, but he reminds them of the unity of the three persons in one Lord. There are many spiritual gifts, verses 4 through 6, 
only one, but only one spirit. And the same spirit gives them the ability to say, Jesus is Lord, verse 3. Every gift is given for some benefit, and is not merely a plaything, verse 7. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and is nonetheless one, so also is Christ, verse 12. There is one baptism into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons. We have all been given to drink of one spirit, verse 13. One God, one Father, one Christ, one, and one spirit are there for the whole assembly of the run church, the Plebs Sancta Dei. In chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, we find Jesus appearing to the disciples to give them power through the Holy Spirit to forgive sins. He appeared to them as they hid behind locked doors in the upper room for fear of the Jews. He, he greeted them simply with, be, Peace be with you. Uh, but it isn't clear it had much effect. Verse 19. After he showed them his hands and his side, however, they rejoiced that it was truly he, and their happiness overcame their fear. Verse 20. He commissioned them simply, Peace be with you. As the Father sent, has sent me, so I send you. Verse 21. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 22. Jesus finished, but finished by, by telling them what would be their responsibility. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Verse 23. This was their baptism into the holiness of his body, into the liberty and joy of forgetting about keeping track of what other people had done to them. But it probably didn't mean much to them at the time in terms of their journeys as followers of the way. How could it? How could they know they'd travel to the ends of the earth preaching the good news of Christ and Him crucified, or that they would spend the rest of their lives glorifying God and, and the risen Christ? How could they know that all of them would be tortured in one way or another, and that all of them, save the young John, would be martyred? Would, and would praise God for the opportunity. How could they know? They didn't know. But for now the Master was once again in their midst. The risen Lord was with them and they were joyful. Going back to the first reading from chapter 2 of the Acts of the Apostles, we see the culmination of the Master's work among us, including what we see in chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, and the fulfillment of the prayerful song in Psalm 104. In the reading from chapter 12 of his first epistle to the Corinthians, we see Paul reminding them of the good news. Christ is risen. The church is filthy with all kinds of fruits of the Spirit, and they, we, are all in it together to serve the Lord in one united body and to be refreshed by the one Spirit. We see the fulfillment of the promises and the evidence that the body of Christ was thriving, although growing beyond Jerusalem and into uh, already uh, gr growing uh, beyond Jerusalem and into the wider world. The disciples were certain, safe and happy when the risen Lord walked among them, dined with them, and continued teaching them. At the ascension, however, they watched him ascend and knew he had left them. The uncertainty and fear returned, but they waited in faith. They still had no idea what the future held for them. They still did not understand the holy, life-changing blessings they would bring to the world when they forgave sins in his name, either. After Pentecost, however, there was no fear. There was certainty in their minds instead. This was the confirmation of their baptisms, empowering them as sent ones, as apostles, to evangelize the world. The divine infection had already begun, and they had already received a baptism for that. In this one, they were anointed as warriors in Christ's campaign of universal salvation. It was a clear and concise demonstration of just how important their overall healing work powered by the Holy Spirit would be. The responsibility in this regard would be great. 
whether or not Pentecost brought understanding to them, it brought what is called perfect faith to them. Their faith was now the faith of experience and they were on fire with it. Uh, the fire, as it were, the apostles received at Pentecost was the true beginning of the church's apostolic ministry, that is, its mission to bear the good news to the ends of the earth. For those of us uh, from the Vietnam era, the, the words of a song back then should reflect a little of what both the disciples and the people around them must have thought. There's something happening here, but what it is ain't exactly clear from Buffalo Springfield. Okay, okay, I, I took it out of context, but the words are perfect and the rest of the song wanders away from the point here. The rushing of the wind, the disciples preaching the good news in languages they didn't know, all of it verified by the Jews from all over the world who gathered around them, were the signs of the Holy Spirit breaking loose into the world. All of it happened as Jesus had said it would. This was the comforter he had promised to send them. Just so, with the signs of God's faithfulness all around them and bubbling up out of them in words they couldn't understand, their ministries began in earnest and the mission of the church was born. Their faith was, uh, they overwhelmed their fears and the bright light of it illumined the multitudes. Wherever they went thereafter didn't matter because it wasn't their plan or even their calculated execution of it that mattered. The journey was for proclaiming the kingdom of heaven at every opportunity and in accordance with the instructions they'd received from the Son of God himself. Uh, this is how it is with us, by the way. This is how it ought to be with us. Each one of us moves in the world as a wounded fellow traveler, but with a mission of healing for the plebs Sancta Dei. All of us, with our prayers, our smiles, and our help, provide healing in a dark world as we extend and deepen the holy infection of it by our Abba. No matter how small and insignificant we may think our efforts and their effects, the journey belongs to the Master as well. I, for one, have difficulty seeing what Jesus sees in me, and I figure I'm pretty average in that way. But we should all remember the, the story of the little boy throwing the starfish back in the water one by one, despite how littered the beach was with them. We're not supposed to decide what's important or not. That's up to God. Our job is to follow his, compa compa his commandments one, one step at a time. All of the lessons today speak to us about the impact of the Holy Spirit on the lives of all mankind and especially on the life of the church which is the body of Christ and the plebs sancta dei. The word for spirit, breath, breeze, or wind in Hebrew is ruach. Um, in Latin almost the same thing occurs. Spiritus can mean spirit, uh, breath, or breeze in English. The same goes for Greek where pneuma is the word for spirit wind or breath. Among the ancients, a wind or a breeze was understood to be a consequence of God's breath. For pagans, the breath of the gods. For us, the breath of God created life. The breath of God gave life to Adam. The breath of the Son of God gave life to the disciples. First for the healing power to forgive sins, and then when the Holy Spirit descended on them at Pentecost to empower their ministries of evangelization. My predecessor in the Diocese of the Isles of St. Brendan, Bishop Dwayne Edward Hauser, was truly a sent one, an apostle, who took care throughout his journey among us to ease the pains of the ones whom the Master presented to him. He did it with humor and love, not always challenging and not always commiserating, but led by the Spirit and so showing up at the right time with the right stuff. It seems to me this kind of approach is one we all should practice. 
Jesus needs all of us followers of the way in, his, in this deal to reach the goal of infecting the entire world with his holiness and bringing the kingdom of heaven to it. <clears throat> it is God's plan that we do so. It isn't our job to recoil in horror at the standing stones of the world and withdraw to the safe environs of a high mountaintop someplace or other. We're to get dirty. We're, so, we're to carve crosses on the standing stones in our way and lift them up for Christ to sanctify. We're not to hide. We're, we're to help. We're to get dirty. With the power of the Holy Spirit, it's what we do as followers of the way. This Pentecost and always, we are our Abba's children. Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Redeemer. We already have the joyful evidence of his love for us. It's written in our histories and in our hearts. Let us be free when we share it. Whether our way is quiet or loud, let us respond to the Holy Spirit, the Comforter who strengthens us with trust and certainty. Let us enter into the dance our Lord offers us, and let us jump in with both feet. God bless you and yours, and keep you in the hollow of his hand. <laughs>